Good evening and welcome to the Dutch Center. Good evening to our small audience here at the Dutch Church and also you watching from home. We are very happy to be back again with another evening to mark Dutch Liberation Day, which was on the 5th of May. Tonight, we are bringing you music from forgotten composers during the Nazi regime. We will talk to Eleanor Paameyer speaking to us from the Netherlands. She's the founder and artistic director of the Leo Smit Stichting. There will be a short concert by violinist Amarins Wiertma and pianist Joseph Havlet, and you'll be able to ask your questions. If you do have a question, send us a WhatsApp message to the number on the screen, or you can use our chat function on our YouTube channel. Joseph Fort, our musical advisor, conductor, and lecturer in music at King's College London, is with us remotely to talk to Eleonora tonight. Thank you very much, both of you, for being here and welcome. Um, I would almost say, Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daphna. And I'd like to start by saying thank you, Eleonora, and what a great privilege it is for us to be able to talk to you this evening. Um, as the founder of the, um, of the Forbidden Music Regained project and the artistic director of it. And what I'm hoping this evening is that it won't just be a tremendously informative evening for us all, but it'll also be a chance to get your personal perspective on, on, um, on this music and on the project that, uh, that you've been running now for a number of years. And so I thought that I'd start off by asking you to tell us a little bit about how the Forbidden Music Regained project came into being in the first place and what uh, what led you to to found it it started in 1994 when i was asked to give a concert at the jewish museum in amsterdam together with my pianist frans van rutt and the question was can you please perform works by dutch jewish composers Honestly, I had never given that any thought. Who is thinking of the religion of a composer, except for maybe Olivier Messiaen, who we all know that he is a very was a very devoted Catholic, and Johann Sebastian Bach, who of course is a Lutheran. And we know that that's a big part of his of his work and his life. But Jewish composers. But fortunately, Frans van Rutt had good knowledge uh, of, of uh, Dutch music, much more than I did at the time. And um, in that concert, uh, I played for the first time uh, the flute sonata by Leo Schmidt. I'm a flutist, by the way. And I was completely stuck with that sonata. And it was so, so... I mean, I was not stuck, I was struck. It's just one letter difference, but I was really, you know, it was for me, bang, bang to my heart. And I thought the beautiful flute repertoire that I like so much, like Francis Poulenc, Darius Mio, and then also Ravel, Debussy, it's all fantastic repertoire. And Leo Schmidt, nobody ever played his music and nobody had ever heard of him. So I found out that he was born in 1900 and that he was killed in a concentration camp, Sobibor, in 1943. But I also found out that that flute sonata was his last composition. And the middle movement, the beautiful lento, he writes in the, you see it in the score, in the handwriting, he writes February 1943 and two months later they took his life so i mean i was touched by the piece that in the first place but i was also very touched by this story and um, i befriended leo smith's sister she was still alive at the time and she was 86 and she told me about him and 
we, with the musicians uh, who were at that concert, we produced a first CD uh, called Dutch Jewish Composers. And I think they would all be so amazed and probably not even happily amazed to, to be named like that. You know, they were all, okay, they had a Jewish background, but they were very, uh, you know, really not religious people. They were just going about their musical careers, etc. But okay, through the, the friendship with, with the sister of Leo Schmidt, um, it was to her that I for the, for the first time mentioned, well, you know, it's nice, we have a CD now. The CD, by the way, got a lot of attention because that was 1995, and that was 50 years after the ending of the Second World War. So there were write-ups in the paper, so the time was was on our side, let's say. But still, it took me so long to get this project off the ground. We started the concert series in Amsterdam, in the old Jewish neighborhood, where there is a lovely synagogue called uh, the Eulenburger Synagogue. So our series was called the Eulenburger Concerte. And there we, every time we played music by, by neglected, forgotten, persecuted composers. And you have to realize that all this music was forbidden during World War II. You could not play that music because it was from a Jew or it was from somebody who was in the in the resistance. And in the end, for the Forbidden Music Project, that, that of course that started later. First we had sort of to, to get to know the repertoire. Um, but we had did a research for, for uh, about uh, 35 uh, composers. So that was quite uh, an endeavor. But I'm so happy that we have that uh, Forbidden Music uh, Regained project. And I love that name because it, it gives exactly what we want to do. The music was forbidden. Then it was more or less lost. It was neglected. And now yeah, when we bring it back, and especially that's why I'm also so happy tonight with two young musicians playing this music, then it is regained. And this is what I really want, you know, that, that this music goes back to us all. It's our European in, inheritance. It, is, it goes to the public, it goes to the musicians. So yeah, that's, that's my goal. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eleonora. And that it really is such a, a vast um, repository and, and resource that, that you've built up um, uh, on, uh, on the website, on the Forbidden Music Regained uh, Project website. And I wonder if there's anything, um, anything that you feel kind of linking the, the music stylistically or, or common themes that have come up or that not necessarily across all the, the compositions on there at all, but any particular themes that you find the composers decide to write music about during that, uh, that period? This is all concert music. And um, it was really written for the stage. And before the war, the composers were not at all aware of the situation. Okay, they maybe read in the paper what happened in Germany, but everybody in the Netherlands thought we would be neutral, like we were in the First World War. So nobody, nobody was worrying too much. And um, if you say, well, there is an, of course, you can, within these 35 composers, you can detect that uh, many composers were very fond of French music. This is the case with, with Leo Schmidt. This is certainly the case with Henriette Bosmans, who we will hear music of in this concert. And yeah, so many, many composers were really fond of, of French music and listened to it, but there were others and they had maybe had their education in, in Germany, in Leipzig or Berlin or in, in, in Vienna. And they sometimes composed much more, uh, I wouldn't say German, but you could certainly hear the influence from these countries. And at some point when the tension in Europe became really in the 30s became really bad, so to say, it was actually almost a political statement. If you wanted to show that you were sort of in favor of German Austrian music, you would use the Tristan chord. 
And if you would show that, that you were really inclined uh, in, for French music, you would use a chord that's in the beginning of, of the Prelude à l'après-midi de Faune, the afternoon of the Faune from, uh, from Debussy. So this was almost a political statement and it's very interested, interesting. And many people ask me, does this music sound Jewish? And for the main part of these 35 composers, that is totally not the case. But there were some, uh, Simon Gokkes and Hans Krieg, who really wrote uh, music also for service in the synagogue. And they used sometimes Hebrew um, texts for their, for their uh, work. So there, there were certainly a few, but like I said, the main part was really music for the, for the stage. That really is fascinating. Thank you. And I guess, yes, it reminds us of the almost, I guess, of the, of the inseparability of, of music from the, the time and place for which it was written. Um, now, one thing I was wondering, looking at the, um, at the website and listening to what you were saying about that sort of poignant um, uh, story of the of, of Leo Smith's um, last flute uh, piece from from 1943 is that um, composers if you like a half of the of the equation aren't they because they need the performers <laughs> as well so there, there are these two halves of it and when you've been researching all of this um, have you found anything out um, much about the performers as well who were who were playing and singing this music at the time well in the case of leo schmidt let me be very clear he was a uh, already as, as soon as he finished the conserva conservatory he was a very promising composer it was already in 1925 so he was 25 years old that he presented his score to the Concertgebouw Orchestra and they performed his his work and later they performed his harp concerto um, written for the famous harpist Rosa Speer and uh, then he, he wrote beautiful ballet music and he made it into an orchestral suite it's called Shem Selnihar it's a sort of Scheherazade and that was premiered by Ber by um, Pierre Monteux. So you can see that, that he was really, he was on the way for having a, a great career. And, and from other composers, um, I can say the same, like, especially if we look what we have on the program tonight, Mariette Bosmans was herself a famous concert pianist. And also her works were performed by the Concertgebouw Orchestra. And Geza Fried was also a fantastic pianist who performed as a, as a soloist. So, I mean, a, a, a lot of these composers had a really, a really good, good career. But the ones who, who perished during the war, that was the problem. I mean, they were not there to continue to promote their music. Uh, their families were very often also murdered and then the time changed because after the war as we all know the music very quickly changed it became much more abstract music the modernism uh, came and and actually when i grew up musically speaking at the conservatory people said to me you are playing lex van Velde, marius vlothuis but that is very old fashioned music. That's not hip at all. So, you know, this is what, what, yeah, what people said. So it took some, a, really a while till, and now I think that there is much more interest to look on what was before modernism, what, what composers were there and what, what music was composed. And there's one thing actually that I want to mention uh, because it's very important that the whole website project Forbidden Music Regained and also the book that we wrote, which will be soon uh, translated in English this uh, fall actually with uh, Toccata Perez, um, that I did all this work together with uh, Karin Alders. She's a musicologist and she also works worked for the um, for the Leo Smith Stichting, she's now busy for her uh, PhD. So, but I mean, she's not 
not yet and not uh, anymore working for the foundation but she's still always there so i can always ask her questions fortunately because she had a really big part also in this whole this whole building the the, the website putting all the content in it was it was a lot of work <laughs> Well, it's certainly it, you, looking at the website that I mean the amount of work that has gone into that uh, uh, really comes across because it's it's such a, a vast resource and going back to what you were just saying Eleanor about the um, about the stylistic change after the war and here in the UK we have um, in universities we quite often have music courses that um, they say music uh, music from 1945 onwards and you think well that's a you know why do you choose that date but there really is a, it's a, a sort of stylistic shift at that point probably partly as people try to to forget the, the time before then as well um, I wonder if you'd like to I wonder if you'd like to yeah. tell us um, about uh, other notable performances that have come up as a result of this project in, in more recent time yeah yeah right I, actually um i think you put it very well i think the fact that this music was neglected was not only this the change of style i think also especially in this country where the most jews uh, percentage wise were uh, actually deported because we are such a small con country and so well organized so it was so easy to to find them um i think the people were very ashamed and uh, yeah and they didn't want to look back they wanted to look forward and that the music changed after world war ii it's it's a sort of logical after after this enormous disaster that had happened and and just thinking of all the bombs on, on London, but also the bombs on German cities and the bombs on our cities. I mean, that that gave such a, a like a shock wave. So that that, that was an enormous, uh, enormous, um, yeah, change, cut really. Yeah, you put that very well. Uh, and performances, yeah, it starts now really because of this website. We can get messages actually from all over the world. I get a flutist from Canada and he says, uh, I'm going to play the flute sonata by Leo Smith. Do you think this is a Canadian first performance? And I say, yes. <laughs> and told my, my big fortune, the Concertgebouw Orchestra, Orchestra had uh, 70 years after the war for the first time uh, the piece on the on the music stand that uh, that was the first piece of Leo Smith that they performed, but it had to take seventy years before they, they acknowledged that this was an important thing to do. Actually, next year they will perform a piece by Henriette Bosmans for violin and orchestra, the concert stuck. So and yeah, we we had a, a lovely trio playing in in Spain, music by Dick Kattenberg in Parliament. This was also on Holland, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, there are performances in in Germany, in in Rostock, in Schwerin. Uh, there is even a competition in in Schwerin where it's called Verfemte Musik. So that's ostracized music, and the players up till thirty years old. In this competition, they have to play uh, already in the first round one piece by a, a forbidden um, composer. So, so it is really. I, I, I think the interest is in increasing, and 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 actually, uh, I hear a lot of comments from people from why don't we know this music? Where where has it been? And we have two great pianists, the, the brothers uh, Jussen, and they play Leo Smith's Divertimento. And actually they are really sort of ambassadors for, for this, for us, for this composer. And they, they play it all over the world. And yeah, sometimes I get a message like, yeah, we played it here and here. And oh, the people are so enthusiastic. So that, that is great. But there, actually there are so many and there are such good women composers a very funny story of a composer called Fania Shapiro and she was my piano teacher when I was 15. She, she um, survived the war in hiding. She gave piano lessons in, in Hilversum where all the broadcasts, radio um, 
office hours are. She, she taught at the conservatorium, but I was a private studi student because I was too young. I never knew she composed, <laughs> but actually she, she did and very good. And we're actually making yet at this, as we speak, we're making editions of her, of her piano works, of her piano forehands work. There's a lovely flute sonata. There is a cello sonata. And I sent it out to, to friends and players. I get very enthusiastic um, reactions. Like people who say, oh, we, we want to put this on CD. <laughs> so. <laughs> So yeah, but I mean, it it it, it sounds like m many 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 successes. But my foundation, Leo Smith Foundation, uh, is this year in in uh, the silver uh, jubileum. Do you let's say that twenty five years? But it took that time to get attention from yeah from from people, from musicians, from conductors. Yeah. Well. Um... Congratulations on the on the important milestone anniversary, and I think thank you for from all of us for for that tenacity that it has taken, especially in those early and probably quite thankless years uh, when you're, you're persevering and setting it all up. Um, this has it's been absolutely wonderful to talk uh, to talk with you, Eleonora, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more later. But now let's hand back uh, to, the, to the Dutch Church and to um, to Daphne, who I think will introduce Amarins and um, and and Joseph, who are going to um, let us hear some of this wonderful music. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you, especially Eleonora, for this story. We will hear from you again shortly. Um, if you, the audience, do have any questions, send us a WhatsApp message to the number on the screen, or, as I said, you can use the chat function on our YouTube channel. And the audience here, we have a microphone for you uh, shortly. And uh, now I'd like to introduce violinist Amarins Wiertsma, and she'll give a brief introduction to tonight's music. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, everybody online. Um, it's slightly strange talking to an audience right over here and online, but I will direct my attentions to the online audience, and hopefully you guys will um, not mind. Um, so we're very, very happy to be playing here tonight. Um, I'm so grateful and so grateful for hearing this little talk with Eleonore and Joe. And it's so interesting to play a, a Dutch recital program. I think it's the first time I've ever done a, a fully Dutch program. And it's, it's really an honor, actually. Um, I'm very grateful to Eleonore for setting up this website because without the website, I would have never found this music. Um, actually, the, the Henriette Bosman's piece, I did know before, I have to admit. Um, it was recommended to me when I was 12 years old by my teacher, Koosje Weisenbeek, who actually recently passed away. And I remember her telling me, oh, this would be a perfect little piece. Um, at the end of a competition, you will, you will charm the audience. <laughs> um, and yeah, the other two pieces are, I think, really gems that I would not have found without this website. Um, the Lex van Delden is incredibly fun sonata, about 15 minutes long, and I think it has, as um, Leonora was saying, a little bit of the French influence. It has a lot of jazzy elements and a lot of rhythmic sections, but definitely we can also hear the Impressionist influence. Um, the Geza Fried, which will be at the end of the program, is much more of a Hungarian influence. Um, I read that he actually studied with Kodai and with Bartok, that are very well-known names to us, us. And you can definitely hear that um, Hungarian element, and it's, it's very free and a really a concert piece. So I hope you will enjoy, and thank you so much to the Stichting and to, for having us tonight, and enjoy this hidden music. <laughs> Thank you. 
you very much for this beautiful performance to Amarins and Joseph. Um, we will now go back to Eleanor and Joseph Fort uh, to talk further about this music. I'm handing it back again. Thank you, Daphna, and renewed thanks to Amarin's uh, Viesma and to Joseph Havlitt for that performance that I think uh, wasn't just highly illuminating, but also deeply moving. So thank you ever so much for that. And to recap, what we just heard was the Sonata for Violin and Piano by Lex van Delden, um, the, uh, um, the Arietta by Henrietta Bosmans, and the Podium Suite by Geza Fried. And we've already had some excellent questions coming in from our audience that I'll be putting to Eleonora in a moment. But I wonder, first of all, Eleonora, is there anything or any anything about the music or any perhaps anecdotes or anything that you'd like to tell us um, in relation to the music that we've just heard? Well, I'm totally pleased with this performance. It was uh, electrifying and uh, wonderful and, and not only that it was so well played but i had really the idea that the musicians understood the music so well and it's very interesting because we started actually with the the piece from the three that's the newest because i oh, had new but it was composed in 1964 and lex van delden at the time was 45 years old and this is always good to have when you think about the life of a composer as a consideration because um yeah it, it actually it is a, a fantastic piece and and i i loved it it was just that it was played with such a, a vigor with so much power and and yeah that 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 sounded that sounded fantastic and then the piece by Harriet bosmans uh, that's a really early piece. It is written in 1915, and you could tell that it was just not not just because it's it's excellent. That she was only 20 years old at the time. It's it's written in 1915, and then the piece by uh, by Geta Fried. I find also that that is very interesting when we consider that Geta Fried is was born in 1904, and in 19 27 he moved to the netherlands and he was happy to because he had a terrible time in hungary he was a child prodigy he gave his first concerts when he was seven and he had an ec excellent education there but the, the regime of um, of uh, general horta was terribly anti-semitic so I think he was very glad that he got out. And then is it interesting to think that he wrote this wonderful podium suite one year later. And I think this uh, is probably part of it that, that, that this piece sounds to me very Hungarian and, uh, and wild sometimes, but th that slow movement that, that was so, so beautiful. And yeah, they played that also very nice so the, so the contrasts were were very good and yeah so i i, I was thinking of of Geisa Fried who had uh, uh, Zoltan Kodai as a composition teacher and he had Bela Bartok as a piano teacher and he was the rest of his life he always stayed uh, friends with them so that is is very good to um, to know and to um, to consider and Lex van Delde already in 1964 had uh, actually a good career. And next to his uh, composing, he was also a very well-known music journalist, and um, that that was that was great because he he really could write very well about music and. I had the incredible honor <laughs> that he interviewed me as as a student who just entered the conservatory, so conservatory in 1974 <laughs> and it is so nice that i once have met him and that i of course i kept that uh, that, that newspaper clipping <laughs> always but yeah it is y y we're talking about three really different pieces hmm? uh, van delden is 
uses much more chromatism, I think. And Bosmans is, is yeah, it's really a romantic piece, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then, uh, yeah, Kate Fried has that that fantastic drive with his uh, Hungarian background, and actually all these three composers survived the Second World War. And that's why they had also after the war chances, chances to, to develop, to do things. Lex van Delden never studied uh, composition. He was really a self-made uh, composer because his, his deepest wish actually was to become a, a, um, a doctor. Uh, and uh, but uh, he during the war there was a terrible accident. He lost an eye when a lamp exploded. And after the war, he thought that his dream of being a, a neurosurgeon, uh, he he had to give it up. But second best, and luckily for us, he became a, a yeah very very good composer and he played a big part in Dutch musical life and actually also Henriette Bosmans had played a very big part both before the war and also after uh, since she, she was self such a great pianist actually she was very good friends with Benjamin Britten it's interesting to mention that yeah, they wrote lots of letters back and forth so that's a, also interesting angle and uh, yeah Geza Fried as a as a pianist, I think he he loved to to compose. He loved to play. He he worked day and night. He had also a very difficult time during the war. Uh, he gave uh, about fifty illegal house concerts, and especially at, at the end of the war, when there was nothing more left to eat, people would pay for for a concert. Um, with some food, you know, with some some things to to eat. So, yeah, that's um, that was a very tough time, and never being sure, he uh, miraculously he survived. Uh, Harriet Bosmans was half Jewish, so she had a bit of a better chance. But with the Germans, you, you were never sure what happened. Also, she gave she was involved in these. Um, illegal house concerts and there is a story that she gave a concert in Harlem, the city of Harlem, and that um, that there was they that was detected that there was a um, a concert there and all the people who were listening got a fine, but she as a half half Jew was of course in danger and she managed to escape through the kitchen door, jumped over the garden fence and could bring herself into safety. So all these stories, Lex van Delde was a really a resistance hero. So they all they all had their parts and I think it's so great and, and I ad admire them so much for after the war picking up their lives and what was left of it because Lex van Delde lost all his family and yeah and and built a career so actually they, these were the people who who were able to to perform and to to be exp especially because of course Bosmans and um, Geza Fried were both also performing artists which of course helped and Bosman had uh, Bosmans had already established her career before the war she's a little older than than the other two and Lex van Delden had his job as a music uh, journalist. He, he had a very good position with uh, the newspaper at, the Parole, at Parole. So yeah, that is that is uh, how it went. But the composers actually from from our group of thirty five composers, the composers who were killed, that's the big drif difference. There was nobody anymore to to promote their music because I think for a composer, the, the biggest promotion that's what the composer can do himself by contacting the conductor or musicians you always need people to 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 perform your your work you mentioned that before that is uh, yeah now you're doing that work for them as well um and um eleanor this is absolutely fascinating not just in terms of the, the sort of web of connections that that um all these composers had that you're making so clear for us but also um uh, in terms of the 
um, what you're doing to paint the environment in which they were all working. Um, and I think we have a few questions. I've got a couple um, from people that the people have submitted online. But before I come to those, um, Daphne, are there any questions coming from the church, uh, from our friends in the church right now? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Bert Jan. Um, I have a question. Uh, the composers uh, we heard from, they all survived the war uh, and had a career onwards. I was thinking, uh, did they still perform the music they wrote before and during the war, or did they go on and, and never look back on what they did before? I should answer that, I think. Um, I said probably the war had, had, had a really big input on them. But I know, for example, that Geza Fried, who, who couldn't really work during, during the war, he, he lost his, his Hungarian passport because he moved to the Netherlands. He, he didn't have yet a Dutch nationality. so. He, he had not he had not no papers to show so it was a difficult position and what i know from his son arthur arthur fried and when everything is right arthur is also listening to this concert and listening to our conversation he told me that in fact his father was very very depressed during the war and arthur was then four years old but he has a very good memory so he was the whole day playing cards he he couldn't really do much and many nights he was not at home because it was too dangerous then he slept somewhere here and he slept somewhere there with other people but i think in the case of of Geza Fried, when the war was over and he could start performing and he could start writing and he accompanied singers and i think he he was as happy as a lark as you call it and um yeah i think Bosmans, she had a much, yeah, the more difficult time. Actually, she and her her mother, her father had already passed away before the war. They they had been so hungry, and they were um, in in not in a good physical um, condition. So it took her her a long time to, you know, to get better to sort of pick up her, her career. And it is, this is very interesting, where she wrote earlier in her career, she wrote a lot of music for strings. She has wonderful pieces for, for cello, uh, for violin. Um, we just, um, we are in the process to, to, um, to publish a, a, a violin sonata, which I think is a great, great new piece to the repertoire and uh, not performed since, since its premiere. <laughs> before the war um she had really a career change in her composing because she started to write many many songs and she befriended um, a singer naomi Perugia, and for yeah naomi became her muse and she she composed many many uh, pieces uh songs for 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 her so there's suddenly there is a whole uh, vocal uh, that's that wasn't there so much before and lex van delde um i think he he was doing well because because of his job at the newspaper parole he he had of course a fantastic network and he had many connections and he was just from his job he was at so many concerts in the netherlands I think his music developed, um, uh, and it, it, yeah, he he always um, composed in a in a classical way, neoclassic, if you want. He never got into um, abstract um, atonal music. And the interesting thing is that since he didn't have a, a training at the conservatory, his his way of composing is is very uh, intuitive. So he, but because he was a critic and he was very critical to other performances and pieces that he heard, he was very 
critical to his own music. So with his intuition and that criticism, he was able to to write. Now he has quite a, a big a big oeuvre, and that's a, actually the case. Geza Fritz has has written more than hundred pieces. Van Delden, I think, also. Rosmans a little bit less, but with all the songs, she also uh, has a, has a lot uh, a lot of music. So, but you can really, I think, see in the music how they were influenced. Hmm. Is this is really interesting. I think that certainly um, gives a very, very comprehensive answer to Bertian's uh, question. Um, we're, we're, so, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to try and squeeze in two questions uh, for you, Eleonora, that, that have come in from, uh, from people watching online. The first of, this, uh, first of these questions comes from uh, Wendy and Ajal. They say, we're really enjoying the event. Well done. Can you ask how the music sheets survived the war? particularly when people went into hiding or were deported. Yeah, well, now I can some really tell some war stories because the music sometimes came to us in the most incredible ways. Um, there was a whole pile of music uh, found in an attic. And we had only of this composer, Dick Kattenberg. It is a very pleasant music. I always called him the Dutch Gershwin. And at some point, his, his cousin suddenly had an impulse, went to, to the attic. She knew there was inheritance boxes with, with letters and photos from her mother. And she found a whole pile of music. And we were able to produce a whole CD with this wonderful music by Dick Kattenberg. But there's another story of a composer, Hans Lachmann, who actually survived the war. Kattenberg was killed and he was only, makes you cry, but he was only 24 years old. So, so sad, such a talent. But this Hans Lachmann, um, he, he, when he got older, actually nobody asked for his music anymore. And um, suddenly I got a letter from, from a very well-known uh, saxophonist a jazz musician actually and he said well you have to look into this music by Hans Lachmann because when many years ago I heard his string quartet and that was very good so I got interested you know where I found the music I went to a small town not too far from the Hague it's called Alphen aan de Rijn it was in the house of Hans Lachmann's son Michael but he kept it in his garden shed because the house was rather small nobody cared nobody asked for music it was in a in a big uh, wooden crate but it was in the way so he he moved it to the garden shed with, you know with with all the, the garden tools and equipment and i must say the music was quite a little bit humid and i sat there the whole day and i i wrote there were nine string quartets it was such a, a, a treasure and so another music by samuel schuyer it was already um at the at the at the waste bin on the street ready to be picked up and there were some children on their way to school who, who thought that is not right and they took it so yeah, I, we can fill another evening with all these stories. There's some really lucky finds, essentially, there. Um, and we've got one last question um, that I think is the, the kind of the perfect question um, on which to end the evening. Um, because, uh, of course, we've this is sort of the tip of the iceberg, what we've, um, uh, what we've talked about and heard tonight. And so this question uh, from the audience is, which composers do we definitely need to look up that we didn't hear about tonight? And I guess we could broaden that question out out essentially a tiny bit more just to say um uh, the people for people who've um who've been fascinated by what they've heard uh, this evening what can they do next where can they where can they go to look up more about all of this and to hear more of this music i would recommend to go to the website forbidden music regained because on that website you will find from every composer a picture and a a concise biography that you can read and at the bottom of the biography you will see a list of works but for every composer we have also um, um, written down for recordings and where you can find the music on youtube and when you see a composer and you read about his life and you think hmm, that's interesting uh, then then you can start listening to things and so you have 
35 composers to choose because my my foundation is is named after leo schmidt i would say start with that <laughs> but the katteberg that i mentioned this that dutch gershwin is also fantastic and yeah i i mean yeah these these composers are really my <laughs> yeah how do you say that my my prodigy so yeah i uh, i can recommend all of them Absolutely. Well, thank you ever so much, um, Eleonora Parmia. Thank you ever so much for spending this, this evening with us. It's been a real privilege to talk to you. And I'm going to hand back to Daphne now in the Dutch Church. Thank you very much, Joe, and a big thank you to Eleanor Parmeyer for her fascinating story. I'm afraid this is all we have time for tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank again Amarins, uh, Amarins Wiersma, Joseph Havlet, and you, Eleanor Parmeyer, and of course Joseph Fort for their contrib contributions tonight. Um, next week we'll be, be back uh, with an evening about photography. Um, thank you audience here at the Dutch Church and you online and I hope you can join us then uh, on the 17th. Good evening and see you again soon. <laughs>